Today I'm going to talk about inking, and in particular, inking for a gig poster. So it's not really that different from other types of drawing and inking. Uh, for the most part, I tend to use ink pens. I know there's some professional gig poster artists who use brushes and uh, pen nibs dipped in India ink. But for myself and many of my students, we found that you know you could get you could spill India ink, a little dot here or there, or a streak will ruin the whole thing. So I encourage you to experiment with India ink if, if you want. And actually, you should try India ink at least a few times. You might really enjoy it. But for me, I like to use the pens. Many artists are switching to 100% digital and using uh, Photoshop or Procreate. I still like to do it the old-fashioned way, but I have done a couple posters completely with Procreate. And I definitely use Photoshop for uh, to, to scan the artwork in after the inking is done. All right, I want to show you some of the tools I use. I like to use the Pigma Micron pens. These are archival and have nice dark ink. They don't smear. They come in a wide range of sizes with the smaller pens being used for details and fine lines and larger pens used for the bolder outlines and filling in areas. I like the graphic one quite a bit and I also use the 08, the 05, and the 03. Uh, many artists go smaller than that but I find that these markers dry out a lot quicker the smaller they are and for the way that I create art a lot of the details don't show up in the printing process. There's other pens I would say use what you like try out different types of pens and markers but there is one thing to think about and it's one of the reasons I use these pens is the archivalness of the ink. Often I'm selling the gig poster original artwork afterwards and this ink, I mean this is a this piece is maybe like four years old and it's nice and dark still but some inks tend to turn brown or yellow after a few years so it's, it's something to think about depending on what you're gonna do with the piece. All right, another pen I like to use is called a Pentel brush pen. I think it's called a Pentel pocket brush pen. And it's got a really nice tip on it. My camera's having a hard time focusing on everything going on, so... Um, it has really nice lines. It's much more expressive than the Microns. And these also come with interchangeable ink cartridges. So that's an ink cartridge that you can pop in and they last many years. I have several of these and um, none of them, none of them have went bad yet. They do have a bit of a learning curve, I think, uh, but for me as a painter before I did any posters, I took to it rather easily because, you know, you are working with a brush. I also sometimes use white gel pens to bring out the highlights. This is a Sakura Jelly Roll pen. For larger areas, I've also used white paint markers and they tend to go back into Photoshop to bring out highlights as well. For paper, I like to use Bristol. Bristol is a very smooth middleweight paper and it takes ink very nicely. Some Bristol has a smooth and a rough side. This is the, I can feel it, this is the smooth side and this is the rough side. I always use the smooth side for inking, but you could use the rough side if you wanted more texture, I suppose. Yeah, this is a nice sheet, nice smooth sheet. Another tool that I use is my light table. This is a big industrial sized light table that I got about 10 years ago off of Craigslist for a very expensive price of $100. And I've been using it you know, every poster I've done, I've been using this light table, so. And it's a big piece of glass. And it has a switch on the side. And it lights up. The idea is you can put something down here and then another piece over it and trace. And if you don't have a big old crazy light table like this, you can always use a window on your house. I used to use our sliding glass door as my light table and you can just put a light outside and if you're in a dark room it'll work perfectly as a light table. Inking techniques come down to making lines, stippling, and filling in areas. The brush pen is really nice for expressive lines. 
that change size as you draw. I use it for natural objects like plants, animals, fur, fabric. I also use it to fill in areas. You can also use it for like a dagger style of shading using the point and dragging it in kind of a uniform way. You could also use it to kind of get texture in, in almost like a dry brush. And it's very versatile. It does take some getting used to and if you've done a lot of painting it might feel a little more comfortable to you having a brush. And like I said it's one of my favorite drawing utensils for pen and ink. You don't have to worry about the mess, it's not going to drip on you, you know. uniform lines I like to use the microns. These pins are really nice for lettering or creating anything that's like man-made, a man-made object or anything with definite detail. The graphic one is one of my main pins I use and it's just a really nice bold line. It's nice and uniform. You can go a little bit thinner if you're careful but generally it's it's a pretty uniform line. Here's the 05 and you can see it's a little bit thinner than the graphic one I don't know what I'm creating here, I'm just kinda of making lines as I go. Then the smallest one that I use is the 03 I do have a zero 02 here, and you can see how small that line is starting to get. When I need to draw a straight line, I'll get a ruler. And the micron pins are really good for that. If you're going to draw a circle or something like that, you're going to use a compass or a template. With micron pins, one of the really nice things is because they have such a nice even line, they're really good for cross hatching. So cross hatching is showing areas of value with parallel lines. the values will get. Another drawing technique is called stippling. And stippling is all about showing value with dots. The denser the dots, the darker the area.
The white gel pins are opaque, so you can go back in and bring light areas into the darker areas of ink. I like to use it for details like stars, bubbles, highlights, just anything to bring the light out. You can also use it to go back over cross-hatching to lighten some areas. This monstrosity is I don't know what I created here but it actually <laughs> looks kind of interesting and weird but uh, that was just a quick demo I'm actually working on a inking under here this is a page from a zine I'm working on and I'm working on it pretty much the same way I'd be working on a gig poster even though it's not going to be screen printed table on and the spotlight off. Alright, so I have under here a drawing that I cre created in the computer and then I printed it up and I'm tracing back over this. And so underneath is just some real basic stuff. And I'm going back in and kind of, this is a little different because I'm kind of making things up as I go. If I was working on a gig poster, the sketch would probably be a lot more detailed. This is kind of a little more free form, I think. So the drawing underneath is either a full size pencil sketch for a gig poster or a printout taped together of a digital drawing. If you're doing the gig poster assignment, you're done once the illustration is completely inked. If, if it was a real gig poster, once the inking is done, it would be time to scan it in and start tweaking it in Photoshop to add colors and get it ready to be screen printed. And that's a whole other lesson for another time. With that, I want to say thanks, class. Show Beaujolais, 1970. But in an AM upstairs on Crescent Avenue, I had a conversation with God. We were discussing rhythm, and I said, Rhythm makes everything move, the seasons swing, backs up the elements. like walking Paul Chambers' fingers. My worthy constituent. The universe is a spiraling big band in a polka dotted speakeasy. Effusively generating light every one night stand we agreed that nature can't do without rhythm but rhythm can get along without nature This rhythm, a stylized spring.